The most common assumptions about locomotive leasing is that the railroad doing the leasing either doesn't have enough locomotives with the current levels of traffic or that it doesn't have enough money to buy enough locomotives for the current levels of traffic. In the case of NS, it was contrary to both. With so many locomotives having been out of service and being rebuilt into new AC44C6Ms and SD70ACCs, NS needed fill-in power to keep up with its traffic base. NS was, at that time, buying every piece of used equipment that it could for a couple of reasons. One, they have an excellent rebuilding program. Two, they needed power and the amount of power needed couldn't get churned out by both EMD and GE quick enough at the time, so used power went into service patched or painted once it was inspected. And three, the used power that they bought could be called rebuild fodder since it wasn't going to be required to meet the current and then future January 1, 2015 Tier 4 EPA requirements. Personally, I was hoping that they'd snap up the Canadian Pacific SD9043 Max and the Florida East Coast SD70M-2s when they got sidelined by the new Jeevos. Would have made for some wild and wacky color schemes for a while anyway. The cherry red of CP or the red, white, and blue Rail America or Alaska Railroad look up the Florida East Coast. Would have been interesting. Progress Rail was completing tests on the first pair of SD70 units at its Muncie, Indiana plant in January of 2018. The ACC units were the result of an agreement with Progress Rail to rebuild NS's SD70 units, a key improvement being their conversion from DC to AC traction, just like their standard cab and wide cab dash nines. The most cosmetic change was the replacement of the original standard cab with the stylish new isolated wide cab. The front windows are similar to those on NS's early wide cabs and go back as far as the 1960s with the dual engine DD locomotives on the Union Pacific right up to the phase 2 SD70Ms with the teardrop windshield of the early to mid 2000s. The first two ACCs were numbered as the NS number 1800 and the 1801 and were rebuilt from the NS SD70s number 2537 and the 2548. And if the prototypes were successful, which they were, NS planned to build 50 more, which they are. Former CSX and BNSF units ended up in the hands of the Canadian National in 2018 with them leasing more than 100 locomotives to help with this increase in traffic levels. Because of this, the Black and Red Railroad had become more colorful, both literally and figuratively. A few fun facts about the Norfolk Southern. It's a roughly 20,000 mile system that operates in 22 American states and the District of Columbia. It employs roughly 30,000 people with an annual payroll of about $2.2 billion. NS has over 4,000 locomotives and more than 72,000 freight cars. Of the more than 4,000 locomotives on the railroad, they come in basically two types, approximately 2,500 road locomotives and over 1,500 yard and local diesel units. Road locomotives are used on intermodal trains, unit trains, and major freight trains between terminals. This is because of their higher horsepower, heavily ballasted weight, and 20 to 25 year life expectancy. Over the decades, one major change in railroad locomotion is the prominence of locomotive leasing companies. Locomotive leasing is a fascinating business and I don't know a lot about it, but it seems that leasing is made up of primarily three parts. Original purchase price, finance rate, and residual value at the end of the lease. Railroads used to lease locomotives amongst themselves from units they had stored. Some arrangements went on a regular basis with roads like the Duluth, Mesabi, and Iron Range who had lots of units available in the winter due to the Great Lakes being frozen. Other roads might have units stored during a business slump while another railroad in another part of the country was seeing record traffic levels. Now railroads have better uses for their capital and are not likely to keep spare units around when not needed. So they sell the units or give them back to the lesser when the leases expire. When a locomotive comes off of a lease from a railroad, there will usually still be some economic life left in them. Because of this, some financial institutions still hold the title to the units and would like to get the remaining value out of their investment in them. Maybe they can sell it to another railroad or even another company. If there's a market for leased locomotives, one of the companies that specialize in them can either buy, lease, or administer a short-term lease of these units to others. It's the same approach as when a customer returns their leased car or truck back to the manufacturer. In the modern day, there's still a need for a locomotive pool to move around the country according to market conditions and leasing companies have taken up that opportunity. It also makes sense for them to use older locomotives for that purpose, but keep in mind that CEFX has brand new units that are leased on long term 100% of the year to the Canadian Pacific and the Union Pacific. Early leasing companies like Precision National were just taking locos that they had bought for parts and scrap and prepping them into running condition to earn extra money from leasing them. 
For the most part, the railroads didn't want to dilute their management focus by doing the same themselves. The one exception being Conrail, who along with General Electric, launched their locomotive management services venture better known to rail fans as LMS. The leasing arrangements today between the railroads and the leasing companies have evolved so that the leasing companies take the risk and the railroads pay a higher cost over doing it themselves. The benefit for the railroads is that they end up with more capital readily available for other needs. Reporting Mark FURX's first union rail lease, which is owned by Wells Fargo. Quite a few BNSF former Burlington Northern SD40-2s ended up at First Union and many more were leased to the Iowa, Chicago and Eastern to help their startup. After IC&E received its awaited 55 ex-Union Pacific SD40-2s, I heard that the First Union units were then leased back to the BNSF, but I can't say for sure whether or not that's true. One thing that I can say is true is the Union Pacific debacle with its former SP locomotives. In its rush to rid itself of its perceived junk, it hastily sold many of the former Southern Pacifics only to rent them back later. So, in an ever so sweet example of typical short-sighted corporate thinking on the part of an arrogant company, Union Pacific wound up paying handsomely to lease back locomotives that it previously owned. And that's what I call getting owned. Many of the Wheeling and Lake Erie's SD40-3 rebuilds were actually owned by the CIT group but were under a long-term lease and thus wore the Wheeling's own paint scheme. This itself is similar to the Indiana Railroad SD9043 Max and the New York Susquehanna and Western SD70Ms. However, unlike those roads, the Wheeling went on to purchase the lease units outright when the contract expired rather than giving them back to the leasing company. Norfolk Southern was leasing locomotives to handle traffic surges to alleviate congestion, particularly in its southern network. NS had 90 locomotives on lease in the first quarter of 2018 and added another 50 later in the year. NS CEO James Squires said the additional motor power helped handle traffic growth and helped enable NS to convert 120 older six-axle DC units to like new AC traction locomotives as part of its ongoing DC to AC conversion program. 14 former BNSF SD70 Max from Progress Rail were working on NS in early 2018. The units came from long-term storage in Minnesota and were delivered to the NS at Streeter, Illinois in December. They then ran as a special movement train from Kankakee, Illinois to Bellevue, Ohio for inspection by the mechanical department. The units were then forwarded again, this time to the Chattanooga diesel shop which began releasing them into service in early January. Later that month, several had worked their way out to various points on the system with most working the Alabama division. The units had PRLX reporting marks and were numbered in the 9551 to 9564 series and all wore their original Burlington Northern Grinstein green paint with the exception of the 9564 which was in the current BNSF orange paint scheme. And as long as we're talking about the NS and their locomotive numbering classes, here's some trivia to pique your curiosity. The ex-BNSF SD75Ms that NS bought were originally supposed to be numbered from 2779 to 2785, right behind NS's own SD70M-2s, but was changed to the 2800 to 2806 number series. Then the three New York Susquehanna and Western SD70Ms they bought were numbered 2797 to 2799, right smack between the M-2s and the 75Ms. Another fun fact is the gap that used to exist on Norfolk Southern's roster of ex-Southern Railway High Hood SD40-2s that were numbered from the 3244 to the 3254. Those 11 SD40-2s came off of lease years ago, way back in 1990 if I'm not mistaken, and allegedly they ended up on the Canadian Pacific before they were presumably scattered to the winds. Yet rather than being a foreshadowing of what was about to happen, the majority of their sisters remain on the Norfolk Southern roster to this very day, albeit rebuilt with modern standard cabs replacing the high hoods. I'm bringing this to mind because when we did the high hood video a few weeks back, several of you pointed out that CP had acquired some of NS's high hood SD40-2s, which I was aware of, I saw them in person in fact, but I just didn't think that pointing them out was relevant to that particular video. But I'm assuming that these 11 outcasts are the ones in question. One last little quirk that confused me for the longest time were the 9X Burlington Northern SD60M Triclops units that the NS bought back in 2014. They were numbered 6807 to 6815, right behind the ex-Conrail quality SD60Ms.
Almost immediately upon the splitting of Conrail, both the NS and CSX found themselves very short of power as the 21st century moved in. CSX tackled their diesel power problems by leasing a myriad of colorful second-hand locomotives from pretty much anywhere they could find them, making CSX the most colorful railroad of the new millennium. NS, on the other hand, had a different approach. They went full-on in the opposite direction and ramped up their new diesel locomotive acquisitions for both GE and EMD and literally hurriedly placed all new power into service, no painting required, as soon as it stepped off of the assembly line. This resulted in what many rail fans call the Grey Ghost era on NS. Fast forward almost two decades and once again Class 1s were scrambling for locomotive power wherever they could find it. This time it was the CN and the NS. GECX number 2039 is an ET44AC locomotive that was built by General Electric and is leased by the Canadian National. CN number 3066 is also an ET44AC locomotive that was built by General Electric but is owned by the Canadian National. Note the difference in the two. The 2039 has a bulge in the top middle section while the 3066 does not. Leased units on CN in 2017 and 2018 included ES44 ACs from City Rail, X Santa Fe SD75Ms from Progress Rail, and former CSX-840 CWs from GE's Capital Leasing, otherwise known as GECX. NS took things a little further. While short-term leasing wasn't a particular intended part of the original plan, Upturns in railroad carload traffic and the predictable power shortages that they can cause on some railroads added another aspect to General Electric's alternative locomotive business. Dozens of used Dash 8s, many with the GECX reporting mark, hastily stenciled on their sides and often a simple line painted through the name of the former owners were leased to the power short railroads in 2018, particularly the Canadian National and the Norfolk Southern. Formed in 2016, GE Transportation's pre-owned power and parts business has been offering a fresh approach to the smaller, non-traditional locomotive markets. Pre-owned power and parts, or what I like to call POPs, offers a full range of products from modernized or reconditioned pre-owned locomotives to reconditioned or OEM certified used parts and major components. And if you're confused as to what the OEM stands for, it's Original Equipment Manufacturer. OEM Certified Back Solutions is designed to meet the needs of the short line railroads, regional railroads, and the secondary locomotive market. And that's what the title of this video is all about. During the downturn in Class 1 railroad traffic, GE purchased around 700 retired Dash 8 locomotives in the form of the Dash 832B, the Dash 840B, the Dash 840C, and the Dash 840CW from CSX, NS, UP, and others to serve as core locomotives and as parts donors for GE's global repowering programs. GE partnered with Larry's Truck and Electric to scrap the Dash 8s that were selected as parts donors. GE keeps the core components and Larry's Truck and Electric gets the rest. Larry's Truck performs the same kind of work on its own locomotives, almost all of them EMDs acquired as part of Larry's locomotive resale, refurbishing, leasing, and parts business. Already, more than 250 of the Dash 8 Brutes have been systematically dismantled and harvested for their most valuable parts. Parts such as engines and alternators, blowers, fans, control panels, trucks, and traction motors. The better units have been spared cannibalization and have been made available for rebuilding, modernization, sale, lease, or any other worthwhile considerations. Each locomotive was thoroughly inspected and qualified in a procedure that includes all of the requirements of the conventional 92-day inspection, as well as the additional mechanical and systems checks and tests all backed by GE. Some of the qualification protocols that go into prepping a second-hand locomotive for mainline use is a host of readings to be manually recorded during the test, from the fuel, the oil, and the crankcase pressures to the input for traction horsepower and gross horsepower. Other qualifying procedures involve checking and replenishing fluids, inspecting components, wiring, and piping. Inspections can take 4-6 to six hours per locomotive if there are no complications or issues. Diesels that require heavier work are sent to the GE plant in Erie, the railroad's own shops, or to third-party shops depending upon the circumstances. A good example of this is NS's Dash 9 rebuilding program that we talked about in video T137. Some units are being rebuilt at the GE plants in Erie, Pennsylvania and Fort Worth, Texas, some at the NS's own Roanoke, Virginia and Juniata, Pennsylvania shops, and the blue and gray 4000 and 4001 Sonic Bonnets having been rebuilt in Dansville, New York. 
Harvested components such as traction motor combos, blowers, fans, controls, and more are stored in protected warehouses and then distributed for sale or reconditioning. Prime movers selected for the program are returned for rebuilding at the GE plant in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Others are packaged to be offered as running takeout. Rebuilt engines can also be sold to domestic and international customers. GE offers components and parts as used or as OEM certified. The OEMs undergo a validation and qualification process similar to that given to the locomotives to ensure that they meet quality standards. This line of parts expands the GE portfolio which is significant since historically speaking GE's only ever had new and UX offerings which isn't financially doable for many smaller railroad customers. And despite the innovations and ambition, many short lines and even larger regional railroads aren't readily flush with the cash for new or even used locomotives. Add to that, most short lines are exclusively old school EMD operators. And while the Dash 8 advantages of fuel efficiency, microprocessor controls, greater tractive effort, and improved reliability sound nice, price and familiarity are big obstacles to overcome. We talked about the cost factors in video T137, and in regards to locomotive familiarity, man that's a hard word to say. On short lines such as the WNYP, that's video T139. But even with the price hurdles, second-hand Dash 8s seem to be a good fit for many potential customers, particularly Pan Am Railways with their Dash 8s and the WNYP with their AC46AHs. Pan Am followed up a 20-unit order of XCSX Dash 8s in 2016 with 8 more 40Cs and 12 Dash 840Bs in 2017. And apparently happy with their investment, they returned for more in 2018 and has even kicked around the idea of replacing the rest of its entire EMD fleet, almost 100 of them with Dash 8s. Other takers on the program are the Providence and Worcester and the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad who have both bought former standard cab NS Dash 8s in the fall of 2017. Other roads that have shown interest are potential overseas customers with at least one customer teetering on the possibility of converting Dash 8s to AC traction. Going into 2020, despite their diminishing ranks on the rosters of the Class 1 railroads of North America, there's still a lot of life left in the GE-8 models. That said, it seems only fitting that the steel workhorses that made GE number 1 in the 1980s would embark on new careers nearly 40 years later. For Trains 21, call me AC.